Michael Lee from The Athletic, he writes about it. Every fear for the Sixers postseason flop was exposed in game number one. But should we anticipate more of the same in game number two? He's at Mr. Michael Lee on Twitter, and he writes for The Athletic. And uh, you should get yourself a subscription for The Athletic because I read the post uh, yesterday, and uh, it was uh, very telling. Michael, welcome back to the show. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, So the Sixers have a lot of issues. We know that. It's a flawed team that is trying to cram as much as they can. How – how worried would you be from what you saw Saturday will resurface itself tonight where there are a lot of easy, quick tweaks and fixes? Well, the first thing they have to do is make shots. They have to make three-pointers. Um, they were unusually awful from behind the arc. Uh, J.J. Reddick couldn't get a shot to fall. Tobias Harris only got seven shots. Um, so I think that they'll be able to do some tweaks to make sure that their offense looks a little – uh, similar to what they had. I mean, one of the main issues is that Joel B was out on the perimeter a lot. I think the first uh, – he had 16 possessions in the first quarter, and somebody told me that he had four in the block, four in a low block. They all led to points. He had 12 out on the three-point line. They all led to zero points. And I think that just says a lot about what Joel, how banged up he was and how inefficient he was but also how disjointed the whole offense looked because he was standing out on the perimeter. Now, I know a lot of times he does it to spread the floor and, and uh, create space for Jimmy Butler and things like that, but they don't need him down there, up, uh, up the top. They need him down low, and that's going to create opportunities for Tobias and J.J., and it's going to allow them to get going. I think if somebody else besides Joel gets going, it's going to be good for the Sixers. And to have three starters essentially be no-shows, uh, Ben – uh, Jimmy, I mean, not Jimmy, he obviously showed up, but Ben, J.J., and Tobias all being no-shows, I don't think you can count on that being the case the rest of the series. Yeah, I know, Michael. Uh, what is your read on Embiid essentially saying, I, I found out about 15 minutes, I, I told him. I mean, it almost felt like the Sixers were under the impression he wasn't going to play, and then he was like, hey, surprise, <laughs> I'm here. And, and that's the way the offense looked. It looked like they had game plan for him not to be there. Well, the Sixers game plan him for, for him not being there, the Nets game plan for him being there. So you could tell which team was prepared and which team wasn't. Uh, I think when you do those kind of make those kind of decisions, it's one thing if you've been in a rhythm with your teammates and you've been playing with them throughout, you all of a sudden you may not play and when you come back it feels like it's natural. But he doesn't know these guys. I mean, he missed, you know, fourteen games after the all star break and he doesn't really know who he's playing with because this is a different team than he's played with his entire career. So for him to just show up like he did, I think it really disrupted what everybody else had sort of maybe gone into the game expecting. And that's why they were in such a bad rhythm. And then eventually Jimmy Butler was like, okay, nobody has it. I'm going to take control. And he did. He did a lot to keep him competitive. But the other three starters never had a chance to figure out what they were going to do the rest of the night. And they were just out of, out of uh, you know, out of, out of cohorts. I mean, um, they, were, they were just flummoxed the whole rest of the game. And I think – He's got to do a better job of informing his teammates he's going to play at least be an hour beforehand because, again, they've only played 10 games together as a starting unit, and it doesn't help them if their best player shows up just before tip-off like, hey, guys, let's go, because they don't really know. They don't, they don't know how to play with that. Michael, early in your article, you list a, a slew of issues regarding the Sixers. You go on to say, Joel Embiid's health, Ben Simmons' offensive limitations, non-existent chemistry and cohesion, Tobias Harris's lack of big game experience, limited depth, a leaky defense, unaligned personal agendas, and more could be added to this list. I mean, it's, I, I honestly laughed when I read that article yesterday. I was like, geez, he's 100% right. But when you, the one thing that kind of popped out to me is unaligned personal agendas. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, when you have a team that basically beyond uh, Joel and Ben is uncertain, I mean, um, you know, they have Zaire Smith, they have, you know, guys that only four, Jonah Bolton, that's four guys under contract beyond this season. So why would they all be committed to making it happen this year? I mean, there's, they, they don't know each other and they don't, there isn't enough invested in this season from so many newcomers to say, hey, we're going to go all out for our teammates. I mean, it's it's something that you would like to have. It, it'd be great if it does happen, but it's not something that should be expected. When you have three starters, especially, who are going to be high-in-demand free agents, 
if it goes poorly for the Sixers this year, they're all still going to get paid, whether it's from Philadelphia or somewhere else. So um, I feel like this is something you can't ignore. Um, when you have that many free agents on the team, it's never a good thing, and it's always going to create some discomfort um, and some uncertainty. Like if you uh, don't have a lot of trust for each other and you go out there and play, um, it's going to make it hard for you to just go all out. But um, they got to figure that out. And they Do you gotta think there's a trust up. issue? Of course. Uh, really? Tobias Harris said it. I mean, yeah. if you got to the bottom of the article, he said we got to learn how to trust each other more. Right. And that means making that extra pass. That means, you know, making that screen for that guy. That means, you know, getting the ball out ahead, you know, instead of just dribbling in all fast breaks and transition. You know, you got to trust that your teammate can make a play. And um, right now you can just see that when things went bad, it was like, okay, well, I got to do it. I got I to gotta be the hero and I got to save the day. And Jimmy was able to do his part, but nobody else could. And I think that's where they, things went awry. When you list all of these concerns and they're all valid and they're all eye-opening in their own way, I'm transitioning to a Brett Brown question here because he's been the center of, of jokes, of attacks, of why this team struggles. You know, he's holding them back. That list goes on and on. But I think there is some validity, not some, a lot of validity in the criticism that he receives just because of the team's youth, the team's lack of chemistry. They're new with playing with each other. So that's, in my opinion, where his role can be more important for this particular team for this particular season. Do you agree with that? And what would you like him to do more of, less of, whatever it may be? Well, he's in a tough spot. I mean, you got to realize this is, what, his third team that he's coached this year? Because it's not like he's had the same group all year. They've had a training camp and the benefit of that. So you've given them a completely new team, but you've also given them a certain level of expectations. They yeah. have to go further. And it's a lot of pressure to put on a guy, um, especially when he's not familiar with these guys. And he has a way of running an offense and has a scheme that these players don't necessarily fit that. So you got to make everybody happy. you got to make sure that Joel gets his touches. you got to make sure Jimmy gets his touches. you got to make sure Tobias gets his. And don't forget about J.J. He's got to get his touches, too. So when you got a whole team of guys and everybody's looking to get theirs, because there's a lot of stake. I mean, there's a lot of money at stake uh, this summer if things don't work out well. So when you put all that together and you ask Brett to do it, and the fact that, you know, um, managing partner Josh Harris didn't exactly give him the – you know, greatest vote of confidence before the series started. He's under immense pressure, and I'm sure he's feeling it. So, and the player says that too. You know, don't think for a second the player is unaware that he's under, you know, pressure to deliver because he obviously helped get them to this point. He took them through the process and took all those hits to try to establish a culture. But now they're saying, okay, enough of that. We're trying to win. And so I, I give, I, I give Brett, I cut him a little bit of slack because he has had to coach three different teams this year, and the last one he has to coach, basically he has a mandate, and <laughs> it's tough to try to get it together, um, you know, this quickly. And I'll, I'll repeat this. I've said this before. Um, there's a reason why uh, it's been 15 years since the team that made a midseason trade was able to use that star player and go to a championship. It's hard to make that happen. When you look at the teams that win championships, they don't do anything really dramatic at the deadline. They just try to pull what they have and, and win because you have that chemistry. Trying to do it with just talent is a bigger challenge. Yeah, Michael, uh, a rational response. How about that? Yeah. Uh, Michael Lee from The Athletic here. <laughs> um, no, I, I and I've been on your side, and people blast me here that I'm too on the coach's side, and I agree with you. He's had three different teams. This is a tough spot to be in where the fans have these expectations where, for me, once they made all these roster changes, I said, I got to – it's next year now. I mean, I know that they're saying this year, but how do you expect to win when these guys have played 10 games together? I can't – you said 15 years since uh, somebody added a player at the deadline and they won a championship. Like, it just doesn't happen. No, and it's not, not something that can be expected right away. Um, again, when you have a system that worked last year, I mean, they won 52 games playing a completely different style. Now you had guys who take people off the dribble, who like to work in pick and rolls. That's not what your offense is. Your offense is more about motion and swinging the pass and, uh, you know, uh, getting open looks for guys. It's not really about dribble penetration. But if that's what these guys excel in, then you got to create a system for them. And you did that. You did that to help Jimmy adjust. And then right at the deadline, you get to Tobias Harris. You got another guy you got to make happy. Right. 
it's 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 just a lot to ask, and you know I think it's tough, you know, because you you, you establish relationships with Joel and Ben, and he's been a relationship guy. That's what he that's what he was able to use last year to get some success because we had Dario, Rob, and those guys who and TJ and guys who trusted him, so they've been with him for the long haul. You know, now you don't have too many guys from that process era who can pass along that wisdom and help the other guys understand, hey, yo, the rest of this guy. Like, there's not enough of that. So um, it's, it's a challenge, and uh, you can see it on the floor. Uh, Michael Lee covers the NBA. Uh, the Sixers play the Nets tonight. We could have, we have the game on 97.3 ESPN. Let me get your opinion of the Ben Simmons uh, issue here. Is it an issue? Is he an issue? And are teams around the league now kind of licking their chops when they get the opportunity to play him in a long series? Um. Well, he's got a lot of things he's got to improve on. And I know everyone makes an issue about his shot, but I'm not going to focus on his shot. We know he can't shoot. That's the one thing that we've known, you know, since he came into the league, that he's not a good shooter. But, you know, if you hear a lot of comparisons, him being like a tall Rondo. Well, you look at what Rondo did. He can't shoot, but he made shots. And he made you He made you feel him on the floor. And I think that when you have Jared Dudley guarding you, you have to make sure the Nets feel you. You can't let Jared Dudley guard you and create turnovers and also um, take it to you and, and cross you up and make you stumble. Like, you have to dominate that matchup if that's what the Nets are going to throw at you. And if you're an all-star player and you're 6'10", and – Joel is struggling, and your teammates need you. You can't go out there quietly just trying to collect rebounds and assists. You have to go out there and make the other team feel you, either by, you know, making plays in transition, making plays on defense, you know, having that that fast break dunk that's going to inspire your teammates in the crowd, getting a block shot. Like, there are ways you can make your presence felt without shooting a jumper. And I think sometimes it gets too caught up in, you know, the fans and their reaction you know, at the free throw line and things like that, he's got to focus on making sure that people know that Ben Simmons is on the floor. And there's too many times, and especially in that Boston series and in game one, where you didn't even notice he was out there. No question. Uh, so, Michael, what do you do with Embiid at this point? Do you sit him down and just say, look, let's get you rested for this series and hope to have you for the round two if we can get there? Or if he comes to you and says, coach, I'm in tonight. Do you just have to keep playing him even though if you don't know that day? Uh, how do you handle Embiid moving forward? You know what? If he wants to play and he tells me he's ready, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know what, Joel, I trust you. But the minute I see you're not moving right, the minute I see you lumbering, the minute I see you not jumping or rebounding, I don't even know who we know can put everything because we love we love the fact that you got it out, big fella. We love the fact that you got heart. We no one's gonna question that. But we can't have you out here compromised and hurting us. I mean, um Jay, Jimmy Butler said it best after the game, you know, um, you know, we, we love to have him out here. We need you out here. But sometimes you can hurt us if you're not actually gonna be able to give us what we need. And I think what they need is MP being a physically dominant presence in the inside, or at least a decoy. He can't come out there compromised, demanding touches in the post and, and not able to deliver because he has teammates who can actually come through for him. And uh, we talk about trust. He's got to trust that the move that Elton Brand made to take to alleviate some of the pressure can actually work out for him. Jimmy had 36. We know Tobias is capable of more than four points. So take a step back. Let those guys carry you, and I think they can win if they do that. But, honestly, I'm going to give a shot. But if I had the option and he says I don't feel right, I'm shutting them down, and we're going to try to win out with one all-star and two borderline all-stars and one of the best shooters in the game and hope that we can do it with that. What about the rotations you saw Saturday, Michael, and what do you expect to to see moving forward and tonight? Because – You know, you mentioned it. You have Jonah Bolden, who's healthy, and then the rest you have Embiid, who's battling through injury. Boban, how much minutes does he get? How much of Mike Scott and the rest of the wing guys do we see or not see? Like, do you want to see any significant changes tonight? Um, I don't know if the rotation was the issue. That's not really what I saw as a problem. I, I, I think my main issue is that the guys who they're counting on to come through and to have have big performances. Other than Jimmy Butler, none of them really showed up. I mean, Joel had a nice stat line, but it was probably one of his least efficient games and least impactful games that he's had all year. And then we already talked about the other three starters. I mean, nine points for Ben, seven points for JJ, and four points for Tobias Harris. I mean, 
they should be happy that they only lost by nine. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. honestly, because if you, th- you had three starters that did not show up, and that's just that's just unacceptable at this at this stage of the season, <laughs> especially with so much at stake. Like they, those guys got to play. And like I said, I, I doubt that they'll have more performances like that. Yeah. They may not have great games, but they won't be miserable. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, sometimes you know I get accused of being the too pat, you know, patient, and uh, you know everything's going to be okay. I look at three for twenty six, and I say, "There's your game right there." I mean, Mike Scott's exactly a 40, it, yeah. Mike Scott's a forty percent three point shooter. He was one for eight. Tobias just looked like he was hesitant. If they shoot the three, they average eleven threes per game. They win the game, right? It's, I mean, it's a simple game, you know. Everybody says it's a make or miss league, and it really is. They have to make shots. They also have to make sure it'll be easier for them to make shots if the nets aren't con- if they aren't. You know, they're getting things out in transition and on the break. If you're taking the ball out of the basket every time and bringing it up, it sort of allows them to set up their defense, and that makes it a little harder. What they got to do is try to get get some things, some easy baskets, force the turnovers, um, do some things on the defensive end, get yourself going, get the crowd into it, get your energy level up. Um, that starts on the defensive end, and honestly, I think their flaws on offense were a result of the fact they just they didn't make them feel the, they didn't make the Nets feel them on defense. They just let them have a layup line. So those guys get comfortable, get open looks from three. Uh, they didn't run through screens. It was just like, whatever you want, guys, y'all can have it. And then we'll, we'll just get the ball back and we'll just sit up here and miss more threes and let you guys do what we're supposed to be doing. And I think they got to they got to change that up. And really, it starts on the defensive end. They gotta play defense. <laughs> yeah. Like you can't just you can't give a team that has no playoff experience confidence. And that's what they did. They don't have a lot of confidence, but if you get an open look, it's not going to feel like the playoffs are any different. It's just like you're not going to be scared or intimidated by the moment because everything you get is so easy. Absolutely. The Nets, who, like you said, a young team a couple of years ago, they were one of the bottom dwellers, and they looked like the team that was just playing with all the swagger, all the confidence, and like playing with house money. I mean, obviously, we're we're following the Sixers. We cover the Sixers. That's our focus. But how much credit do you give the Nets? Like, obviously, the Sixers, like you listed, a long list of concerns and issues. But the Nets did do some good things. And like you said, the Sixers were taking the ball out of the basket a lot of the day. I know that has to do a little bit with the Sixers' defense. But how much of the Nets are you just kind of tipping your hat a little bit and saying, wow, good game plan. They played hard and made shots. It was a good game plan, but I think anybody going into this series, you know, who watched the Nets play the Sixers this year knows that they, they were the worst matchup for them because, you know, they have a problem with guards who excel in dribble penetration. They have guards, they have trouble with really good guard play, and they come with three of them. So it's not like, you know, you, you take the Angelo Russell out of it and you, you all of a sudden feel like you succeeded. They did that in the first half, but then Karis LeVert is getting buckets, and then Spencer Dinwiddie is getting buckets, and you know, he gets buckets against the Sixers. He has a thirty-six million dollar extension, I think. Uh, I the, think that's how much it was. Yeah, but the he day after, he, the yeah. day after he busted the Sixers for thirty-seven <laughs> points. So this is a group that is known that they didn't come in here thinking, "Oh man, we're playing the mighty third seed Sixers." They're like, "Man, we know we can get these dudes. We know that we would have won the season series if Jimmy Butler doesn't hit a step back three, you know, um, to win to win one of his early games for the Seventy Sixers." So this is a team that's been giving them trouble, and they also know that the last game that the Sixers won, they were coming off a seven game road trip. They're on the last day of a seven game road trip. So the two wins the Sixers got, they can't sit there and be like, "Yeah, we can, we manhandled this team." No, the Nets. They're, they're they're not going to be an easy knockout no. for the Sixers. They're going to be a tough a tough team to take out. And the Sixers were well aware of that coming into this series. They weren't surprised by anything that the Nets did. Yeah, and Michael, I mean, the Nets started the year eight and eighteen and finished forty two and forty. So Impressive. they played really well after that. That being said, uh, Philly's a more talented team here. However, you've been there a lot, Mike. They are a flawed team, right? So. It's still, all, all, every team is flawed. You, they just get exposed a lot more in the playoffs. Absolutely. But would you say that this team ceiling is still, in your mind, a second-round team? Are they are they better than Toronto, who they'll face in the second round most likely? I, I don't see that. Um, I, if, you know, Marcus Saul is sort of an uh, a lot of guys been given an Embiid fits for a long time, and we already know Kawhi Leonard. Relish is going up against Ben Simmons. Like, he inhales Ben Simmons whenever they play each other, you know, because he loves taking it to him 
and I think Ben averaged so close to nine turnovers Ooh. against the Raptors this year. That's because of Kawhi Leonard. Like he 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 would love that. He would love that matchup. Um, so yeah, I think that is their real feeling. But the key, I think, for everybody, and whether you have confidence in this team, is that they have to at least win this series and and play a really competitive series against the Raptors. I'm not saying they're going to win but they have to play a competitive series. They, and they need to get a couple of wins together to just get their swagger. Because I remember when they first came together, they looked amazing. It's like, oh, my gosh, this group is going to be incredible. Yeah. But they just don't look like a confident bunch right now. A lot of it is because they don't know each other, and they don't know what Joel is going to be able to give them. I mean, that's a that's a, that's a tough situation. And, to Michael, be. it seems that they all look to Joel. Like, he's our guy. We need Joel. Like, they know we need a Joel. And if he's not 100%, it's almost like they feel – we're not good enough unless he's 100. percent Yeah, they know that, um, and they they had it. They played enough games without him and looked sloppy in games without him. You know, losing games in Dallas and Atlanta. You know, nine playoff teams. You know, kind of handled them without Joel you know, be So that they they kind of understand. And I, I kept saying, like every time that they lost, it's like Joel Embiid MVP campaign is in the middle of just about how bad it looks when he's not on the floor. Um, and and they they know that, and I think that he he's he's the center of the offense. Everything is built around him. They need to have that dominant interior presence, that guy who can just create matchup problems and you know double teams and get guys open looks. Without that, they got to find more creative ways. And that's just, again, I said I point to Ben Simmons. He has to be the guy who steps up in that situation as he did last year, you know, because they you got to remember he missed eight games at the end of the regular season. They missed. You know, the first game against the, the Heat in the playoffs, I mean, and they didn't have any problems. It wasn't a big deal. <laughs> so, right. because Ben Simmons was playing confident basketball, and he had a great series against Miami, and they need that version of Ben Simmons to come back. And like I said, obviously the, the surrounding sporting cast is different, but the attitude doesn't have to be. And that's what they need from Ben Simmons. They need to see a guy who's going to go out there and make the Nets – feel him, and, and it, it could change the way the outcome of the series. Uh, at Mr. Michael Lee on Twitter, check him out at The Athletic and get a subscription to get his Sixers-Nets coverage. Game two tonight right here on 97.3 ESPN. Uh, we'll see you up there tonight, Michael. Take care, pal. All right. Take care.